Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing how to draw a lattice diagram of subgroups for a finite group. Okay, so in this video what we're going to do is have a look at another example and we're going to look at the example of the symmetric group on the set of three elements and then what I want to do is make some uh, more general comments about the lattice of uh, subgroups for a general finite group. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the example of S3. So firstly, just a reminder of the elements of S3. Now, I'm not going to draw out the great big composition table for S3 like I did for uh, C4 and C6, because it will take far longer than it did uh, for those two, because those two have very simple composition tables to work out, whereas S3 would require me uh, actually doing a bit of computation, uh, which um, would take longer. Okay, so uh, we will just have a look and a reminder of the elements of S3. Okay, so remember S3, uh, the way that you construct it is you imagine having a set of three elements, and we might as well name that those elements 1, 2, and 3, okay? And then we look at every single bijective permutation of uh, the elements of this set, okay? And it turns out that there are six of them, because of course that's three factorial. Okay, so I'm going to display these elements using cycle notation. So, of course, one of them is the identity permutation, which sends every element onto uh, itself. And we'll just represent that by the symbol 1. Okay, uh, then what we'll have is all of the transpositions, which leave one element fixed, but swap two other elements. Okay, so we'll have the transposition uh, which switches 1 and 2, and as I said, I'll use cycle notation to demonstrate or uh, write down my elements of this group. So by this, I mean uh, the permutation which sends 1 to 2 and 2 to 1, but there, of course, fixes 3, so that's a transposition. We'll have the transposition 1, 3, which will send 1 to 3 and 3 to 1, and fixes 2 and we'll have the transposition that sends 2 to 3 and 3 to 2, but fixes 1. Okay, so those are the three transpositions. Then I'll colour code the different elements. So all of these that are being underlined in orange here, these are the transpositions. We've got the identity element, 1 over there. And then finally, we'll have the free cycles. Okay, the elements of the cyclic group on the set of free elements, which cycle all uh, free elements of our set. Okay, so I'll have the free cycle which sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and then 3 to 1. Okay, a very natural cycle. And then you'll have the one that sends everything along by 2. So that sends everything uh, to the right by 1. Now let's send everything to the right by 2. So 1 will go to 3, 3 will end up going to 2, and 2 will end up going to 1. Okay, so those are the two free cycles in here. And those now are all of the elements of S3. And as I say, I'm not going to draw the composition table because it would uh, take too long, okay? It's, it's a task that you can do if you wish, uh, but we're not going to do it here because, as I say, it would dominate uh, over... Um, it would dominate time-wise uh, over forming the lattice of subgroups, which is the thing, of course, that we're aiming to do here, okay? But you're aware, of course, of how you compose these together. You're just imagining doing one of these permutations and then doing another, and then what overall is the net permutation, that's the answer to the two composed together. Okay, right, so now what we want to consider are, is what are the subgroups of this group? Okay, so of course we'll have our usual uh, subgroups, the trivial subgroup, which again we'll denote by uh, one here, and then the improper subgroup, which is the entire group, but now what we want to know is what are the interesting subgroups. So let's uh, again use the Grange's theorem to get some understanding of this. So this group overall has size 6, so the Grange's theorem tells us that the only subgroups that it can have will be of size 2 and size 3, the numbers which divide 6. So let's start with subgroups of size 1. So of course we know that the identity element has to be in a subgroup, so We'll start by putting that one in, and then we just need to pick another element to go here. Now, I claim that you can put any of the transpositions in, and you will actually form a subgroup. So, for instance, if I put in the transposition 1, 2 here, I claim this will be a subgroup isomorphic to C2. And the reason is that the transposition 1, 2, when composed with itself, which is the only thing you have to worry about, because we know, uh, we understand completely what will happen when you just compose the identity with anything. Okay, the only composition that you have to be worried about is what's 1, 2 composed with 1, 2 here. 
Well, of course, a transposition composed with itself is just going to give you the identity permutation because effectively you're swapping one and two around and then you're swapping them back again if you compose it with itself. So indeed, this is going to form uh, a closed subgroup isomorphic to C2. Uh, the transposition is its own inverse in this case. Okay, and that doesn't just go for this transposition, it goes for any of them. Okay, so we can have the transposition 1, 3 in here with the identity permutation, and that forms a subgroup of size 2. And again, uh, we can have the uh, 2 cycle 2, 3 here uh, in a subgroup with 1, and that will form a subgroup of size 2 as well. So all of those are subgroups of size 2. Are there any more subgroups of size 2? Well, we can't put in free cycles, because if you put in the free cycle, you have to have the other free cycle as well. Okay, so you'd end up with too many elements. Uh, so you can't make a subgroup of size 2 that contains one of these. Okay, so we can rule out any more subgroups of size 2. So let's now move on to subgroups of size 3. So again, we'll start off by putting in the identity element, and now if we wanted to build subgroups of size 3 that had the transpositions in, is that possible? So you'd put in a transposition, of course the transposition composed with the, itself gives the identity back again, so that would already be closed, so you'd have to put in another element. Now if you put in a free cycle, you have to have the other free cycle as well, because either of these composed with itself gives the other, so that would give you four elements, so that would be too many. So then the only other option is put in another transposition, so you'd have two transpositions but when you compose two transpositions together, you end up with a free cycle. So you'd have to have one of those in, and it would go out of hand, basically. So you can't build subgroups of size 3 that have transpositions in. So the only other option is to build a subgroup of size 3 that has the two free cycles in. And indeed, that does form a subgroup. So we can put the free cycle 1, 2, 3 in, and we can put the free cycle 1, 3, 2 in. And that does form a subgroup under composition that is isomorphic to C3. Of course it is, because the interpretation is exactly the same as how we build uh, C3. We've just got the cyclic permutations in here. The transpositions, if you like, are the permutations in S3 that are not cyclic permutations, because they're fixing one element. The identity and these two are the cyclic permutations on the set of three elements. So all of them together makes a subgroup that is isomorphic to C3. Okay, so this then is all of the subgroups of S3. So now let's draw its lattice diagram. So again, as always, we start by putting the largest improper subgroup at the top and the smallest trivial subgroup at the bottom, and then we're going to display everything else in between. So this is the biggest subgroup, so this needs to be the highest up. So I'll put this here. So here's uh, the subgroup containing these three elements the identity permutation, the free cycle 1 goes to 2, goes to 3, goes to 1, uh, and then the other free cycle 1, 3, 2 here. Okay, so there's one subgroup, and now let's put the other um, three subgroups on here as well, but they're all going to have to be lower down than this one because they've got fewer elements, so let's put 1 with the uh, transposition 2, 3 here, let's have another subgroup of size 2, 1 with the um, 2 cycle 1, 3 here, and then finally let's put the other one here, and of course all of these are isomorphic to C2, so you've got three copies of C2 if you like inside S3, and then we've got one with the transposition 1, 2 here as well. Okay, so there we go, I'll just colour code everything in, so here we have the three subgroups of size 2, here we have the single subgroup of size 3, and then I'll colour in the uh, two ones that we always have, the improper subgroup and the trivial subgroup in yellow there. Okay, so now all we need to do is actually put lines on here. Okay, so I claim that we can put lines from the trivial subgroup here to all three of these, um, of these subgroups of size 2, because of course these all contain this one, and then there's nothing that's in between the two, because of course all we've done is add in one element, so how could there be anything in between the two? I claim that I can also draw a line from this one to this one, okay, because again, this one certainly contains this, and again, there's nothing that's properly in between the two. Okay, you can't have a subgroup that just contains one of these three cycles, because the instant you have one to be closed, you have to have the other as well. So those lines are all fine. Now, let's draw more lines on this. I claim that I can also draw a line from each one of these um, subgroups of size 2 up to the improper subgroup, 
because again, the improper subgroup certainly contains these subgroups, and again, there's nothing that's properly in between the two. There's no uh, subgroup that properly contains these, and itself is properly contained in this, because this doesn't contain any of these. Again, again, I can draw a line from here to here, because this is contained in this, and there's no subgroup that's uh, properly in between the two. Okay, so there now is my lattice diagram drawn uh, for the group of S3, the symmetric group on the set of three elements. Okay, so that's where I'm going to end the examples. Now what I want to do is just give you a few comments uh, going back to more general uh, finite groups and their lattice diagrams. So the first comment to say is that if you have two groups that are isomorphic to one another, so let's say we have a finite group G1, which is isomorphic to the group G2, which I'll denote like so, equals with a squiggle on top of it, okay, isomorphic. So of course that means that these two groups are the same up to the fact that you've used different symbols. So this one, if you like, can be made by having a relabeling mapping applied to this, an isomorphism applied to this. Okay, uh, they are the same up to the fact that you've used different symbols, and of course the symbols don't matter, they're a figment of our imagination, they are man-made, okay, they're not core to the actual algebraic structure, they're just symbols, okay, so these two as far as the algebraic structure concer is concerned are identical. So, of course, if you have two isomorphic groups, their subgroups are going to correspond perfectly. They're going to have the same subgroups, up to the fact, of course, that the symbols are different, uh, and therefore their lattice diagrams are going to be identical. So that's my first comment. And the second comment to make is that even if you have two groups that are not isomorphic to one another, i.e. they're not the same algebraic structure, it doesn't mean that they won't have the same lattice diagram. Okay, so unfortunately, different groups, truly different groups that are not isomorphic to one another can have the same lattice diagram and therefore a lattice diagram of subgroups is not a way of characterizing a certain class of groups. Okay, so it's not the case that each different class of isomorphic groups has a distinct, unique lattice diagram. It, you can have two very different groups that are not isomorphic to one another which have the same uh, lattice diagram. I know I haven't shown you an example of that, but take it on faith, there are examples where you have two very non-isomorphic groups that have identical lattice structures, okay, i.e. Uh, drawing out one of these sort of diagrams does not characterize uh, a group. Okay, by the way, when I say they have the same lattice diagrams, I mean um, Ignore what the groups actually are and just look at the patterns of um, nodes with lines. That's what I mean by uh, the form of the lattice diagram. Okay, so I, I could find potentially, uh, well, if I have two non-isomorphic groups and I draw this sort of structure with nodes and then lines in between them, and such a structure is actually called a graph in mathematics, where you have points with lines in between them you can find non-isomorphic groups which have the same lattice diagram structure. Okay, I'm not saying that these subgroups, of course, would actually all be identically isomorphic to one another. Of course, that would imply uh, that the two uh, groups were isomorphic to one another. But the structure of the lattice diagram in terms of just looking at nodes and lines, that can be the same between different uh, groups. So, in the language, in the more advanced language, we can say that the graph that you get, which is the lattice diagram for a certain group, is not unique to groups that are isomorphic to that. You can have another group that is not isomorphic to that, which when you generate its lattice diagram, the graph, i.e. the nodes and lines, structure is identical. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Not that, of course, all of the subgroups will be identical. If that was the case, then of course they would be isomorphic. Okay, right, the final comment that I want to make is what happens um, or how you can use a lattice diagram to understand the lattice diagram of a quotient group. Okay, so if you draw the lattice diagram for your initial group, capital G, okay, then if you've got some normal subgroup, that will appear in the lattice diagram. So let's say I have it here. So the lattice diagram will obviously be much bigger. Here's the entire group. Here's the trivial subgroup way below, and you know, you could have an incredibly complicated lattice diagram here, okay? What I claim is that you can actually 
instantly say what the lattice diagram of G quotiented out by N, the quotient group of G by N, is actually going to look like. Okay, and that's because of the correspondence theorem, which we discussed in the video on the third isomorphism theorem. We know that subgroups of the quotient group correspond to subgroups of the initial group that completely contain the normal subgroup that we're quotienting out by. Okay, so actually if you want to look at what the uh, lattice uh, of subgroups is going to look like for this, you just need to look upwards from the normal subgroup. So the normal subgroup might have lots of lines coming out of it. Look at all of these um, subgroups and then go upwards. So each of these subgroups might then have lots of lines going up. And eventually, of course, all, if you follow all of these paths, they'll converge on the entire group here. But that portion of this lattice diagram, which is up from the normal subgroup, that is going to be the lattice diagram for the quotient group. Because as I say, all of these subgroups here that contain the normal subgroup and anything that's above this, so anything where you can follow lines up to something, uh, some other subgroup from the normal subgroup will have to contain this normal subgroup. That will have a corresponding subgroup in the quotient group. Okay, so the lattice diagram of the quotient group, as far as the nodes and lines is concerned, as far as its graph structure is concerned, will be identical to um, this sub-portion of the lattice diagram for the entire group, which is the portion up from the normal subgroup. Of course, you won't want all of this bit down here. Okay, that bit's gone. But now, of course, for the lattice diagram of this, the normal subgroup becomes equivalent to uh, the trivial subgroup, okay, and the entire group, the improper subgroup, remains the improper subgroup for the quotient group. Okay, so that's the final comment, that if you want to find the form of the uh, lattice diagram for the quotient group, you just need to look upwards from the normal subgroup. And when I say upwards, I don't mean if you've got some subgroup over here that isn't actually connected to this one in any way. You don't need to look at that. You only need to look at the ones that you can get from following lines up from the normal subgroup. Because if you can't get to this by following lines up from the normal subgroup, then that means that this doesn't actually contain the normal subgroup. Okay, anything that you can get to from following lines up from the normal subgroup, that will mean that it will have to contain the normal subgroup, because you can follow down uh, a path of containment, basically. Okay, if you've got something up here, let's say H, then going down, let's say you've got H bar here, H will have to contain H bar, and if H bar contains M because it's connected to it, then you can conclude that H contains M because H contains H bar. So anything that you can get to by going up lines from the normal subgroup must contain the normal subgroup and therefore is going to have a corresponding subgroup over here by the correspondence theorem which as I say we discuss in the theorem on the third isomorphism in the video on the third isomorphism theorem if you're uh, not familiar with that. Okay so we will now end this discussion of uh, the lattice diagram of subgroups for a finite group here.